lovely to see you. Welcome to the final installment of a message series that we have been calling Follow. Um, And in this message series, we've been exploring what Jesus says about how we can follow him in our lives. So how we can learn to follow Jesus in this time in which we are alive and how we can be, be a people who are formed by Jesus who are being conformed into his image and who are growing and maturing into the fullness of who Jesus says we are. And our anchor scripture for this whole series has been from the Gospel of Matthew, um, chapter 16, verse 24. And I'm just going to read it to you once again. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. It bears repeating, um, just in case um, you have not been here for the full series of messages, that Jesus' words here are an invitation. He says, if you want to be my follower. In other words, Jesus is saying, I invite you to follow me, but it is your choice. And I think like all of life with Jesus, um, the posture of Jesus. The posture of God towards us is one of invitation. He invites us to follow. So before we go any further, I want to say to you this morning that the message that I'm bringing is an invitation. I do want to say, given what um, Adam said this morning though, I also believe that this morning's message is a holy stitch up. Um, It was so fascinating that he was talking about unity. It was so fascinating he was talking about like what it means essentially to belong to the body of Christ because actually that is the heartbeat of the message that I want to bring today. What it means to be part of the body of Christ. And when we say yes to this invite, um, and this is the interesting thing, when Jesus invites us to something, what this verse also shows us is, and Jesus is really clear, this is what it looks like to be my follower. We must grow in three things. We must grow in giving up our own way. I don't know about you, but I really like my own way. Um, uh, Frank Sinatra very famously said, I did it my way. Um, But interestingly enough, you realize, Frank, it's a great song, but it's a terrible proclamation of Christian followership. Christian followership is, is Jesus, I'm doing it your way. Jesus not my will, but your will be done. The second thing is, is, and again, thrilling and exciting, Jesus invites us to take up our cross. Um, it's so funny when we talk about following that we, it's like we sometimes forget that there is a cost. And we're actually supposed to bear it. And then Jesus says, number three, following him. And the wonderful thing that we've been unpacking over this series is we've been unpacking the fact that the fullness of life is found as we follow Jesus. That if we are to be transformed into the people of God, we need to learn how to follow Jesus well. And today I want to talk about a particular area that I think is more responsible than any other area in terms of derailing us from following Jesus. I want to bring a message that in some ways is actually probably going to be, and I want to be sensitive with this because it's going to be, at points, it's going to be maybe even painful to hear. I want to talk today about what do we do when we are hurt by the followers of Jesus as we follow Jesus. Because as Adam so beautifully put it, the goal of the body of Christ is for us to mature into unity where we can be a blessing. But if you've been a Christian any time at all, you may have experienced that sometimes the people, the followers of Jesus, don't always behave like Jesus and sometimes we hurt one another and it's been my observation that when it comes to following Jesus 
when we stall in that following of Jesus, it's often because someone in the body of Christ has hurt us and we don't know how to deal with it. Now, I'd like to say, can I hear an amen? But <laughs> it kind of feels like, but you know what I mean? Like, when we're hurt, I think what I often see in the body of Christ is that we don't know what to do with it. So today's message, I want to bring this message. And it might seem like a weird message to bring when we're talking about following Jesus. But I want you to hear my heartbeat. My heartbeat is that we will be a church of people who, yes, we may be hurt by one another at some point. But actually, we also know how to deal with the wounds that people give us. Because here's what the Bible says. The Bible says wounds from a friend can be trusted. In other words, when it comes to the people of Christ, the body of Christ, I want you to recognize that these are your brothers and sisters. And sometimes, therefore, they are going to say things and they are going to do things that are going to hurt you. But I believe that actually what the Bible teaches us and what the Bible shows us is, is that we can recover from hurt. We are not supposed to do the following of Jesus for the whole of our lives, wounded and hurt and with the damaging spiritual consequences of living with that hurt. This message I am calling healing from wounds. You see, because as Adam pointed out earlier, like the most beautiful thing that's happening in this church is we are seeing people come from all different kind of walks of life. We are people from different parts of the world. We are people in different areas of work. We are people of different ages. We are people of different interests. Like, it would be really funny for every single one of us to literally come up and talk about, like, what our, diff you know, what was our experience growing up? You know, like, um, where do we come from? What are we interested in? What are the things that make us excited? And I think what would be fascinating would be this. As we listen to each other, we will probably go, I have no idea why any of us are friends. Because we have, you know, like, when we look at each other, we're like, we would recognize, and what we would see is, is we're so different. And yet, here's the thing. The beauty of the body of Christ is exactly that. That God takes us, unformed people, often, you know, like, like deformed people, what God does is he brings us into the body of Christ. And in the body of Christ, what God creates is God creates a family. He takes our different histories, our different stories, our different backgrounds. And in the beauty and the love of Jesus, he weaves us into a family. He creates a place of warmth and of acceptance and of love where we can thrive and where we can grow and where we can discover what it means to follow Jesus together. Let me be really, really clear. Our vision as a church is very, very simple. Our vision as a church is to be a family of believers who are learning to follow Jesus together as we believe to be used for the gospel mission of his kingdom come here in Sunderland as it is in heaven. That's it. We're learning to follow Jesus together. You know, and it's beautiful, isn't it? It's beautiful fam church family. Yes, we're weird. Yes, we're odd. But we're beautifully weird and beautifully odd. You know, we are full of the love of Christ. And because we are full of the love of Christ, we get this opportunity to be family together. And so I want to bring this message for two reasons. I want to bring this message for reason number one. There will be people in here who you have been wounded by the body of Christ. And let me sensitively say this. I don't think you've ever recovered. You walk with that wound today. And I believe that today, like there's a burden in that. And it's disconnected you from God. And it's disconnected you from the family of God. And you've lost like that faith of, and that hope. And you used to have it and you know you used to have it. But somehow it's like 
And it's not that you don't believe in Jesus anymore, but it's more like, you know, that kind of like statement we often hear people say, like, I love Jesus. But his followers, I have issues. Like, I think I could believe in the, in the Christian message if it wasn't for Christians. But I believe that today what God wants to do is God wants to begin a process, to begin a journey where actually you can heal from the wounds. But I also want to speak to some of us, because some of us in here, maybe we've never actually been hurt in church. Well done. <laughs> um, you've never been hurt in church, and you're like, but I want you to know, and here's the reason I want you to know, almost like preemptively, at some point, someone is going to say something really offensive. I apologize. Um, if I have ever done, forgive me. Um, but in all like seriousness, at some point, somebody is going to do something, and often they won't have mean to, but they'll do something that's really hurtful to you, and they won't mean to. And when we experience that, I want you to know what to do because I don't want you to be trapped in it. I don't want it to take you out. I also want to share this message from this angle as well. I want to share this message because I want you to know that this is not theoretical for me. This is something that I have walked through. This is something I have perfect personally experienced. I have experienced the pain. I have experienced the trauma. I have experienced the sense of betrayal when people that you looked up to and who were leading you did not lead you into becoming a person of Christ. And then it felt like they took your gift and they used it for the not for the advancement of the kingdom of God, but for the advancement of their agenda and their identity. And that out of their own pain, and this is what I've realized, out of their own pain, out of their own broken heart, they have broken your heart. And I want, to, I want to kind of bring this message from that point of view because I want you to know that this is not, I'm not just bringing you like a theological framework. I'm bringing you an actual pathway of how to deal with hurt and how to deal with the wounds that happen in the context of church. And I want you, I want to show you what I have learned through this. And it's two very simple things. Number one, healing is possible. And here's the most incredible thing, that as we heal, because of the grace and the beauty and the wonder of who Jesus is, our healing actually leads us into becoming more like Christ. You are never more like Christ when you are wounded by the followers of Christ. Part of taking up our cross, and this is the thing that's hard in church context, is that the deepest wounds will come, sadly, from the people who are part of the body of Christ. And it's hard. Because these are people who are brothers, who are sisters. And sometimes they wound you. Okay. I want to bring you a framework. So to, so to kind of like explain this, um, understanding how to deal with our hurt, interestingly, actually begins at what may seem, at first sight, an unusual place. We need to begin and therefore understand the role of love in the body of Christ. So let me explain. In Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, guys, I've got a graphic. In Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, um, there's these chapters, these three chapters. Um, towards the end of the book, um, chapters 12 to 14. And they show us a biblical framework that I find fascinating. As it holds up, the picture of what the church, the body of Christ, should be. 
So in chapter 12, here's what we see. In chapter 12, Paul speaks about the body of Christ. And in this chapter, he outlines how we are united by one spirit and how that spirit has formed us into this one body, but that body has many parts. And then he talks about some of the giftings that are within that body. And he talks about the fact that if you're gifted here, use that gift. If you're gifted here, use that gift. If you're gifted here, use that gift. And he gives this this picture of the fact that actually the body of Christ is exactly like that. Like we have many different functions. Some of us are more visible. Some of us are more behind the scenes. But everything is vital. And the picture that he's painting here, um, and I've replaced it with a word here, when he talks about the body of Christ, what he is painting a picture of is he's painting a picture of the church as a family. I want you to think about your family right now. Your family, I'm sure, are very different. They have different gifts, different abilities. Do not look at anyone right now. (laughs) I I just saw some people looking across and going, yeah, I know that. Uh, And here's the thing. Now, some of your family, here's the thing also about your family members, which is exactly like the body of Christ. You didn't choose them. <laughs> like, in some of the cases, for example, like, you just happen, you know, you just happen to know the other person because guess what? Your brother or sister married them, and now they're part of your family. And they just rocked up one day, and it's like, here's a new member of the family. And you're like, cool. Now, here's the beautiful thing. Often it is cool, and it's amazing. You know, you form some really beautiful um, friendships and stuff like this. But as we also know, sometimes family's a bit weird. Like, um, like it is. I just think of my own family. I'm moving on. Um, <laughs> now, here's the interesting thing as well. Then, in chapter 13, we see this. This is this in really fascinating chapter where Paul speaks about love. And then, in chapter 14, he speaks about two of the spiritual gifts that are the fruit of this vital connection with love. And when you look at it, you're like, Paul, did you like get distracted? You were talking about the body of Christ and how it's all a family. And then you're talking about how there are gifts in that family. And then you start talking about gifts again here. But then you've just got this weird segue about love. But I'm so sure you realize what looks like a segue is absolutely not a segue. Because when Paul speaks about love, although it seems like a tangent, it's absolutely not. Here's what he is showing us. And this is so powerful. And it's really important for us to understand why when we get wounded, it hurts so much. Look at this. Here's the, log- here's the thinking and the logic. Paul is saying the body of Christ is a family. That family is activated by and grows in the Father's love. As we grow in the Father's love, we are able to love, guess what? One another. And out of the love of the Father and the love that we have for one another, spiritual gifts are activated and we become, because the interesting gift he talks about here is he talks about prophecy. So what's Paul saying? He's saying that as we are rooted and established and grow in love, the gifting of God is activating in a way where we become the prophetic people of God, allowing God's agenda of recreation to take place in our world. Family, love, and the gifting of God flows out into the world. Connection with one another Connection with the Father, connection with the world. These are the triples that we are called to. This therefore explains why the wounds in the church, if we just keep that up there, the wounds in the church are so hard to deal with and why they are so damaging when not dealt with. Because when all these things work together, guess what they create? They create healthy church. But here's what Satan does is he attacks this first. Because if he can attack us as the body of Christ, then guess what we do? We then become disconnected from the love of the Father. And as we become disconnected from the love of the Father, 
the spiritual gifting that is on us actually begins to start flowing through us. And when we are not connected to the love of the Father, not only do we get disconnected from the family of God, we begin to spiritually die. I want to make a point here. Like, family is one thing. It's physical. It's emotional. Like, you know, when you're a family, you are connected to each other, you know, like physically, like in some when you're a son or daughter, genetically. But it's also an emotional thing. But here's why the wounds in the church hurt deeper. It's because it's spiritual too. It's actually in a weird sort of way, it's kind of more than the family, our, our physical family. When our physical family hurt us, it's emotional and it's physical. But when we suffer a wound from the spiritual family of God, it is emotional, it is physical, but it is spiritual. And that's why it hurts so much. But I do want to point out to you, in the same way where God says, where there is unity, I command a blessing. The agenda of Satan is very clear. If he can disconnect us from the family of God, he knows we will no longer be useful. His desire is division. In the same way as God, because it talks about it so often throughout the Bible, that God is growing us together, building us together as a community so that what? We can become fruitful. That's the desire of God. Draws all of our differences together, puts them in a great big melting pot, and because we are all surrendered to Jesus, we are surrendering our gifts to Jesus, and then what activates is the spiritual gifting, and the church becomes this prophetic witness in the world where even when it is dark, we are able to be a prophetic people that say the light shines in the darkness, and the light is greater than the darkness, and the light will always pierce the darkness, and as it pierces the darkness, it will bring about the fruits of the Holy Spirit, and the fruits of the Holy Spirit in the people of God are love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. And as we begin to exhibit those, those more and more, we will become a prophetic people that where we step into the places that God has planted us, we walk into our work, not just on a physical and emotional and intellectual level. We walk in with spiritual authority whereby we can actually prophesy a different future than the one that is in there. We're like um, Adam was talking about earlier, where we get our young people together. And why do we get them together? We get them together to go to festivals like this because we want them to encounter prophetically the witness of the Holy Spirit in their lives that says, whatever school you have come to, whatever university you have come to, whatever you think the plan, of, the plan is for your life, the plan of God is greater than that. The plan of God is deeper than that. The plan of God for your life is spiritual. There is a spiritual anointing on the plan of God for you. And that spirit is to break another spirit spirit. It is to break the spirit of fear. It is to break the spirit of division. It is to break the spirit of wounding. Wounding is a spirit, but you are also called to be healed, to be made well. And what I want to share in literally the five minutes that I have, because I want to bring us to a place um, where I actually really want to invite the Holy Spirit to do a work. This framework shows us some really powerful things that I think it's important for us to consider in terms of how do we therefore get well? When we are wounded, what do we do? Number one, healing is found in family. It's an irony of church life that the people of God are the people who, who are able to hurt us the most. But the interesting thing is, is that though that happens, the plan of Jesus is the same. The plan of Jesus is, in the same way as the, the family of believers wounded you, my plan is, is that through the family of believers, you will be restored. And I think it's really important that we use this word family, and here's why. Because I don't know if you realize this, your family are the people that you love, 
But they are also the people who annoy you and irritate you the most in the entire world. It's like somehow you're like, God, why? Why did you bring these people to me? Let me help you. God placed you in in a family because he knew that if you didn't have a family, you would be an utter tyrant on your own. You need family to take the edges off you because you're like, you're like a sharpened axe, just like going around chopping people's heads off. Not all the time. And I'm, I'm being, I'm using hyperbole here, but you know what I mean? You know, like when you, like you get really irritated and you, you speak those words like over a family member and then you're like, oh, I really should not have said that. There's something about being in the safety of family that, that brings out some of the sharp tongued nature on the inside of you where you just feel like it's all right. We love each other. I can say exactly what I think, you know, and then we're kind of like, and then you're like, oh, my word, I literally, w-. and you're like, I wonder if there's like a fishing line that I can just like w- wind that back in. But I think that the reason that God places this in human families is so we learn things. We learn things like, I'm not going to say that. I don't have to say every single thought that comes to mind. We learn things like, do you know what? I'm going to go away and I'm going to pray about that because like, although they're annoying me, maybe I need to learn something here. Family is a place of love where we learn to grow and we learn actually things like self-control. We learn things like, I can choose love here rather than a sharp tongue. You see, families, and the reason why God, the reason why our healing begins within the family of God, even though they were the people who wounded us, is because here's what God has designed. God has designed families because families are the most resilient, powerful, and prophetic relationships which mirror our connection with God. They are what we are called to be a part of. But I also want you to hear this, just so that you don't, because here's something I think we do in the church. I think what we do is we overexpect in the family of God. It is great for you to have a high view of church. I think you should do. Jesus does. But I also want you to recognize your brothers and sisters in Christ are growing. Your brothers and sisters in Christ are becoming, are becoming more like Christ. Your brothers and sisters are not the perfect image of Christ. If you have not worked that out yet, you're clearly not close enough to them. <laughs> but that's the beauty of the church. The beauty of the church is not built on us being perfect people. The beauty of the church, and it took me so long to realize this, the beauty of the church is this, is that we are a people who are committed to loving Jesus. And we are a people who, as we live in the love of Jesus, as we anchor ourselves in that love of Jesus, we actually become more like Jesus. And over time, we learn some of those grown-up, beautiful, maturing love emotions of peace and patience and joy and kindness, and that we are growing in those things. And so there's a practice that goes along with this. Your family practice for this particular part is forgiveness. From Colossians 3.13, basically it says, if you read this, I love this, I love this in NLT, it says this, make allowances for each other's faults. I don't know about this, but sometimes I'm like, no, I don't want to. (laughs) But then the beautiful thing is, is is about family, is family anchors me back and goes, it's not about what you want to do. You're a family. You need to learn to maybe like grow up a little bit and actually bear with one another's imperfections. All right then. (laughs) But then it goes on to this. And how do we learn to do that? Look what it says. It says, Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Here's the beautiful thing. Jesus realizes you're going to offend each other. The goal of church is not to be, uh, the goal of church as it were, is not let's work on being, let's work on making sure that we never offend each other. 
Like Jesus is much more realistic than I think some of us are about church. He's like saying, when he says, you know, make allowances for each other's faults, forgive each other when they offend you, he's saying, they're going to offend you. Because they're different and you're different. And they have a different story and you have a different story. What I want you to learn to do when that happens is forgive them. I wonder how much our family relationships would change if we just practiced the simple thing of, I'm going to forgive. The beautiful thing about this as well is this. When it says forgive, how? I don't know about you, but sometimes, and I've heard this, forgiveness is a decision. Absolutely is. But forgiveness as a decision will only remain a decision unless, and this is where number two comes in, love. So, pathway number one is healing is found in family. Yes, the family of God hurt you, but actually the way, the beauty of Jesus is that he's placed someone else in the family who can help you get well. Number two, healing is found in the Father's love. How do we forgive? When you rest in the Father's love long enough, here's what you know. You know, I am utterly loved despite my imperfections. I cannot be more loved by God than I am right now. And when you, ha- when you experience that regularly, here's what you experience. You experience self-acceptance. You accept yourself as you are, that you are growing, you're on a journey. And the beauty of that is, is it allows you the compassion to be able to see in your brother and sister who has offended you, hey, you're on a journey too. We're both actually connected. What are we connected by? We're not connected just because we're family. We're connected because both of us are seeking and in connection with the grace of God and the love of God together because I'm imperfect, you're imperfect. We both rely on the grace and the love of God to even stand here. And there's a funny thing that when we actually saturate ourselves in the love of God, it does two things. It makes us realize how accepted we are, but it also makes us realize how much of a sinner we are. And actually, that's good for us, that we recognize we're not as good as we think we are. And that without Christ, we're definitely not as good as we think we are. And that we need Christ. And the thing about that is is that it allows you, because you can... You can forgive, you can make the decision to forgive, but that forgiveness becomes real, it becomes rooted when actually we find ourselves in the Father's love. Because the Father's love's working through our decision to forgive actually allows love to flow. And when the person who has, offen- who, who has offended you, when they experience from you that, I notice as well here, this is the supernatural love of the Father that you are giving. You have made the decision to forgive, and now out of that decision, you are being filled with the love of the Father. And the love of the Father is agape love. It is a love which does not need return. It is a love which is not rooted in our own personal passions and desires and all the rest of that kind of stuff. It is a love which is supernatural and therefore is able to supernaturally reach the offended person. What if the church of Jesus Christ was a place where we practiced the forgiveness of the Father and the love of the Father and that we saturated ourselves so much in the love of the Father that actually forgiveness became normal, forgiveness became easy, forgiveness became the hallmark of who we are. This is what we see in 1 Corinthians 13 verses 4 to 7. It says this, love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no records of being wronged. This morning right now, I feel like God wants to say to you, I want to remind you of my love so that you can stop keeping a record. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. It never loses faith. It is always hopeful, and it endures through every circumstance, including offense. 
We often see this passage because it's read so often at weddings as this kind of romantic picture. It is not a romantic picture or just a romantic picture. It is a picture of the never-ending, everlasting love of the Father that he has for you, which allows you to love other people even when they hurt you, even when they have done stuff to you. It allows you actually to be so saturated in that love that you are able to stretch out a hand and say, I love you, I love you, I love you, and I will never stop loving you. It allows you, even though it's them who, as it were, who put you on the cross, you can say, just like Jesus, Father, forgive them. Why? Because they don't know what they're doing. So often when people wound us in church, you have to recognize they didn't know what they were doing. They didn't mean it. Yes, it felt personal and it felt, but they didn't mean it the way that you received it. They were ignorant. They were immature. They were not as saturated in the Father as they should have been when they had that conversation. Jesus invites you, will you receive the Father's love? The practice for this one's real simple. It's like, it's like this. Will you receive his love? Will we be a body of people who create space to regularly receive the Father's love? The final one is this. Healing is prophetic. saw that final one, it said prophecy. This is where the next step of our healing. So we've forgiven, we've received the Father's love. Now what we need to do is we need to prophesy to our spirit. We need to speak a different story. And it's things like this. And it's the importance of speaking of the future in our present. I am healing. I am becoming whole again. I can trust people again. I can be part of this family. I will forgive. I will choose to forgive again and again. Like in the Bible, the disciples ask, like, Father, how, how, how often should I forgive? And Jesus says, 70 times 7, in other words, infinitely. Elsewhere in Matthew's gospel, it says, somebody asks him the question, he goes, if, 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 if somebody like, you know, does something wrong, and then they ask for my forgiveness, and then in the same day they do something wrong again, and they ask for my forgiveness, like, what should I do? And Jesus says, you forgive them every single day. Every single day. The Lord's Prayer, which is supposed to be a daily prayer, what's one of the lines in that? Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. It's supposed to be a daily prayer because here's the truth. Being part of a family is hard. And we need to forgive each other every day. I mean, hopefully not every day, but you know, <laughs> sometimes it is every day. Our job is to be prophetic. Our job is to be a people who, and Ephesians 4, verses 15, 16, Paul puts it this way. He says, instead, we speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. Notice that thing, the body again. He makes the whole body fit together. He's the one who fits it together. And as each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that each so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. The body of Christ, filled with the love of Christ, becomes the prophetic people of God who actually live out on mission. Us getting over our wounds, it is we forgive, we love, and we prophetically declare our healing and our wholeness 
until God has finished the work. Because here's what we're recognizing. God, you're doing something in me. God, you are growing me. This is not the end. This wound is not going to take me out. Devil, you are not going to separate me or divide me from the family of God because in my future is the family of God. Your future is this family. This is a Holy Spirit stitch up that you have been called to this church for this time and this moment. It's a Holy Spirit stitch up because what God sees in you actually alloys with what is in us and what is in us comes together and it becomes a powerful prophetic witness that speaks into Sunderland and breaks the chains. We sing songs like break every chain, break every chain. We are not just talking about our own personal chains. We are talking about the chains of those people out there, those people who are in chains to addiction, those people who are in chains to whatever it is that has got them in chain. We, we are speaking, of course, over our own chains and saying, God, these chains no longer shall hold me because prophetically I am saying my brother or sister in Christ is able to pray over me and there is, a, there is an anointed power over them that when they pray for that particular thing, it's going to come off me. This is not just about me and Kat having some kind of like, we've got all the, all the gifts between us and whatever you're going through, we can absolutely set you free from it. Absolutely not. I hate to break it to you. I'm not that good. Cat may be, but me, definitely not. Like, we are limited human people filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit has given us unique gifts. But the power, like Ephesians talks about, is when all of our gifts are surrendered to one another. They help us grow and they help us come in love. Thank you.